Hi everyone and welcome to In Deep Geek. This is the next in a series of Secrets of Videos where we're exploring the secret, mysterious places in Westeros. And this is a video I've been looking forward to for Firstly, because this is going as a premiere. So if you are watching this live, then it is happening as a premiere. And this is a charity premiere. So all proceeds from this video, every super chat, every super sticker, all of the advertising for the first month or so, and then I'll demonetize it. Uh, all of that is going to go to charity to the International Rescue Committee, the IRC. For those who don't know it, it was the semi-official charity for Game of Thrones. Lena Headey is a patron of it, and they do fantastic work. They, they go into war zones and they help get non-combatants out. They're trying to get the people who completely innocent out of war zones which is a fantastic thing to be doing so that is what this is all in aid of please 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 if you have the money please do contribute to that super chats uh, super stickers if you're watching this live uh, or i will put a link down in the description if you are not watching this live if you're watching this later so that's the first thing the second thing a special guest today who i'm very excited to have one of the ogs perhaps even the og of Game of Thrones YouTubers. Um, it's his first time on this channel, but he is probably well known to you already. Tony Teflon, do you want to say hi? Well, what's the deal, my people? Thank you, Robert, for having me on here. I'm very excited to be on here, especially to talk about what we talk about. And I'm very excited that you're happy that you're willing to support charities. You know, that's the best thing I think anyone can do is give back to the community. So I will be watching this premiere when it does go live and I will donate myself to this uh, and give what I can for it. And I hope that anyone else who is watching does give to the give what they can to it's a very good cause and well well the honor is all mine as i said you are one of the ogs i mean i have to admit i came into this game slightly late but you were were you the first uh, game of thrones youtuber i'm not entirely sure no i wasn't the first game of thrones youtuber i'm <laughs> dead old robert <laughs> well you know i'm just trying to give you as much credit as i can man yeah i have been here for a long time i you know i can't say i'm the, I'm the first I've been here a very long time, been doing this for a long time. One of one of the first, you know, History of Westeros was here. They were posting up videos and I think a few other places, but not seriously. You know what I mean? So it was really me, the small council, James of Thrones and all of us that really, you know, jumped everything off, especially when it came to doing live streams. We're the first people who have a live stream Game of Thrones. So that's the first we can we could take credit for. But uh, I wasn't the first YouTuber to ever do it, but one of the first. Excellent. Well, it is my honor to have you on. Uh, there is a link to Tony's channel, which is te uh, Teflon TV, down in the description. So, so please do go and check that out. But today we are talking about the children of the forest. Now, Tony, I know this is a subject that you, you're you passionate about, something you've thought about a lot. Do you want to just give us like the, uh, the headlines on this in terms of the who they are? descriptions what what are they like you know to me personally i hate them so it's hard for me to <laughs> a great description of them but you know they are what in the story they're supposed to be the uh the magic in this story you know there's targaryen magic which would be kind of fire magic these are more like the earth magic type situations i would also look at them as you know uh, the the modern day you know american indian you know someone who had land and the land was taken from them and but these Indians, I think, got even a little bit more than the regular American Indians did did here in America. So when you look at them, I think they're supposed to come across as that those two things are very spiritual, earth uh, earthbound type of creatures that you know that worship nature more than anything else. Yes, yeah, so, and and they are quite like what we saw on the TV show. So they're 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 shorter. They're uh, they they use natural things they're not about building huge buildings or anything like that they they live in the forest as their name kind of implies um and they're very much in tune with nature and that is what their nature magic is all about so we've got a few examples haven't we of 
of what their magic is we've got uh, and we'll come on to the whole situation with the others in just a moment but they do uh, we are told according to legend have powers over things like waters with the hammer of the waters do you want to just give us a uh, a little bit of an oversight in terms of what happened uh, with their magical powers in terms of trying to stop the invasion of humans into their land. Yeah, so while the people were crossing the dawn, the, the, the bridge, the armored dawn, uh, they did not like the migration. They were coming across too much. And, and while they were coming across, the biggest problem they had with them was that they were chopping down the wayward trees and using them. So as you said, the children of the forest, they never lived in places like that. They need structures or anything to live in. You know, they lived in caves and everything else. So it was uh, uh, foreign to them for someone to use these materials for building things like this. So in order to to stop them from crossing because they were just coming too much, they went to the Isle of Faces. And while at the Isle of Faces, they performed a spell, which is they called the Hammers of Water, which truly is more of a, a gigantic earthquake. I think it just has a fancy name, but when you really look at it, it's just a huge earthquake. And they used this to, to break the arm of dawn to try to prevent the flow of humans. But in the end, that did not stop humans from coming over because I think they were more thinking about themselves and how they would stop themselves because they always travel by foot. But I don't think they was realizing that human beings build things like boats and just breaking an arm and breaking a landmass is not going to stop their migration. No, that, that's really interesting. Thank you for that. So the children of the forest, we kind of associate them with Westeros, don't we? Is that this is their land? There are in Essos legends of woods walkers and things like that, which sound a little bit like the children of the forest. Um, and to my mind, these were probably originally one race, but then kind of got separated. So they're like cousins or something now. Do you, do you think that's what happened? Or is this just about the the children of the forest just being Westeros, summing up the kind of the nature, the, 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 the continent, as it were? No, I, they definitely are. They definitely are the same race, just living in different places. And they changed uh, the way they look by because of the where they lived. And but because you hear when Leaf talks about, you hear her talking about how far she walks and how how this is something that she walks and walks and walks for years and years, so that they do migrate. That's what they they were about, and I do believe they did move to a different continent. And when you live in different areas, people change. You know, if you look at the human race, the human race most likely, from all we know, were all born in Africa, but and they crossed and they walked across to all the the continents. And by living in different atmosphere, uh, different places. This is when you become start to look different and you change towards your environment. So I think that's what happened to the children of the forest when they went over there. They're the same uh, race, but then when they moved away, they just changed uh, their look. So, I mean, this is a slight digression, but I'm, I'm fascinated by this because I've not really explored this before. On Essos, we don't have children of the forest, but we do have legends of woods walkers and all the rest of it. And also on Essos, we don't have weirwood trees, but we do have these kind of shade of the evening trees that we got out in Carth, outside the, the House of the Undying, which seem to be uh, sort of opposite, very similar, but opposite to weirwoods, perhaps. There was um, uh, a friend of the channel, Amanda Disputed Lands, I know has got a fantastic theory that they're kind of poisoned weirwood trees. Do, what... Do you, what do you think's going on there? Do you think that these that, that they are they used to be weirwood trees and and they're not anymore or something else? It seems like Amanda could be right though on that that they are some form of poison weirwood tree. I think that they would use serve the same exact purpose as weirwood trees just on their continent. You know, things grow differently uh, depending on where it's at. And I think that's basically most likely what happened here. It's the weirwood tree of that isle. And if the children were over there, that's what they would worship would be those type of weirwood trees over there. Because when you look at the properties and the way the sap runs and everything else, it seems to be the exact opposite of everything that we learned from the weirwood trees uh, on uh, on Westeros. Yeah, I, I, I agree completely. I, I think this is very, very true. So, what we get when we get, and this is a digression I will move away from in a moment, I promise, but you get the, the, effectively the sap of the shade of the evening trees. 
is this uh, Shade of the Evening drink that Euron's got, that the, the warlocks use, uh, that the thing that turns your lips blue, that gives you visions. This seems to be sort of a corrupted version of what Bran drinks north of the wall, the kind of the weirwood sap that allows him to get access to the weirwood network and all the rest of it. So, yeah, it, if I had to guess, I would say that, yes, this was a culture which spanned across both continents, and then they kind of got separated in some way. So uh, perhaps this is a matter of when the hammer of the waters happened, that cut off what was in Essos from what was in Westeros. And my take on the Weirwood network is not just mine. I know many other people have the same thought is that the Weirwoods are just one huge network underground. They're all connected. And so if you have the hammer of the waters, you, you, you sunder the two lands, then that perhaps is what causes this kind of what looks like poisoning or corruption of, of the Weirwood trees over in Essos. But Digression over. Let's get back to the children of the forest here. Um, so we've got the children. You you said you hate them, which we will try and unpack in a moment why you hate them. Because from what we've been talking about so far, it's quite a sympathetic story, isn't it? This was their land. They shared it perhaps with giants and wolves and whatever that were there before. And then people came in afterwards and took their land away from them why why would you hate them well when you look at it that way yes they are very sympathetic in the beginning but when you also when you look at closely at to what they actually do and how they operate you could see that there's some underhandedness going on with them you know so when you deal with the children on the forest yes they did their land was taken but they always fought people. It says in the world of ice and fire that there wasn't a race that they ever ex came across that they didn't fight. They were always fighting. So when you first start thinking, oh, these are peaceful people just living on their land, they were not that peaceful. You know, there's giant bones with many weirwood arrows all throughout them. And the giants didn't do anything like the humans did. They did. The giants weren't building structures, yet they found the time to fight them. So they are a warring. Uh, uh, type of person, uh, whatever you want to call them, purple type of people, they do have that in their nature. And when you look at the powers that they actually use, their spells, they're all diabolical. You know, I know like people like to call it skin changing, or warging, and things like this, but it truly is just body snatching, right? And if you look at it as that, and you call it that, that's what it is, a body snatcher, there's nothing good about a body snatcher, right? There's nothing good about someone who takes control of somebody else and does whatever they want to do to them. Uh, there's nothing good about it. You hear Melisandre says she doesn't sleep. Why doesn't she sleep? She says because dreams are uh, come from the great others, right? And she's afraid to dream because people can get in your dreams. As you said, when you brought up Euron, the shade of the evening, I don't know if that exactly causes people to allow you to go in your dreams, but I think it makes you more susceptible to it. Uh, I would think that when you're dealing with Euron, it's quite possible Euron could be holding a glass candle. And when you look at all these instruments that other people have, it seems that all these other instruments are trying to uh, do the children's powers without actually having them. That's what the glass candle does, gives you the ability to go inside somebody's dream. So I think by drinking that shade of the evening, it could make you more susceptible for someone to go inside of your dreams and make you do more hallucinations and stuff. So when you look at the, what they're actually doing to creatures and they're doing to humans and stuff, it's not that good. So yes, they are sympathetic at one behalf. And as George always liked to do, everything is gray, right? So you, you could feel bad for them on this behalf, but you look at the whole picture of them and you see that they're not really that good. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think I was really interesting i'd not picked up on that thing in the world of ice and fire about them always being at war with other uh other nations and peoples that's uh, that's a really interesting point uh, and added to what you were just saying their magic i mean all magic in the world of ice and fire but their magic in particular seems to be based on sacrifice doesn't it so when we talk about the hammer of the waters yes this is a huge amount of very impressive magic but 
we learn that that was achieved through the sacrifice of many hundreds of, of their own folk and perhaps some captured people as well. Do you want to just talk about the weirwoods and the relationship between the children of the forest and the weirwoods? Because I think this helps us unpack how they operate in terms of what they see, how they see themselves in the long term because the relationship between the children of the forest and the weirwoods is not just like that they worship the trees they feel they they go into the trees in some way don't they yes they feel like their ancestors are a part of these trees that all the memories and everything in their beings and their souls of their ancestors all exist inside of these trees so when they when they that's how they that's what they worship them but when you look at how the faces came about on these trees you mm -hmm. can see that it's a little bit more diabolical right they do feel that way that their ancestors live in the trees. But when the pact was signed is when they started car carving faces into the trees on the Isle of Faces. And then they and then they had it so that there had to be a weirwood in each one of these people's kingdoms and their castles, right, with the face in it. And they thought that the faces were spying on them. That's what the human beings saw. So for some reason, we think that these faces are spying on us. Somehow these people can see us do it, but they can never prove it or anything like that. That's just what they thought about, you know, which was entirely true. That's what they did. So they were diabolical when they used them. Like when it was first just watching, uh, I mean, representing their people. Yes, that that's a great thing. And, and it could be true that they do live in there. And that's why they didn't want them chopped down. But by carving the faces so that they can see and spy on people is a diabolical nature of the children of the forest. Who I believe, uh, it, when you if you had to pick one person that's evil in this, I would say that they are the evil people uh, in this whole story, more than the White Walkers. More than White what interesting, and we will get onto that in just one second. But I, I want to pick up on the pact because you talked about the pact. The pact is something that's always fascinated me. So for those who are unaware of the history, so we get the first men come in uh they start off in dawn but they move their way up through westeros and they're at war with the children of the forest and then eventually there's a pact there's a a, a cessation of war and it's on the isle of faces and it sounds like this is or the way it's presented is that this is two sides who just like decided you know what we work better together will 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 agree to share this continent but when you start digging into it it actually looks kind of weird because humanity humans were winning if you were happen to count this as a war they they there were more of them they were they were chopping down trees all over the place they were moving through the land the amount of lands that the children of the forest had were shrinking but in the pact yes they agreed to stop fighting each other but also you find that humans then started worshipping the weirwood trees they started coming on board with what the children of the the forest were were all about and the children of the forest were given their own lands and humans said well we're not going to go there anymore and it doesn't kind of add up because humanity was winning so why would they just call off uh, the fight and actually admit that your gods are better than our gods, so to speak. So, what, I mean, what's your take on the pact? How does that, how does that work with you? Yeah, it doesn't sit well with me, you know, because as you said, there's no reason for them to have done the pact. Mankind, they could really wipe them out, unless, unless for some reason, as we said before, they did think that the trees were spying on, them, unless some children were able to get to them somehow. The children were able to somehow convince them it's in our best interest if we come together. Now, we all have to remember the children of the forest have the ability to see the future, right? They can see everything that's coming. So it's no, it could be that they foresaw the Andals coming and they knew and they started talking to them, a couple of people here and a couple of people there and said, hey, this something can come that can wipe us both out sooner or later. 
unless we get together on this. That would make more sense if something like that happened. Then that would make them, the human beings, believe in them and believe that, hey, we should worship these gods because these people are white. Somehow, if you're going to start believing in some gods or something like that, you have to prove to that person that that God is real somehow. So mm -hmm. in some way, somehow, the children prove that, hey, these gods are real to the point that well, these people adopted them. All right. So that's basically how it is, whether it was, you know, Jesus uh, in our time and he was turning wine to water and people would say he got resurrected and he was doing that. Water into wine, I think. Water into wine. <laughs> <laughs> that would be less impressive. <laughs> it would be, it would be. You know, but, you know, if I lived back then, you know, and I had a package of, you know, Kool-Aid and I sprinkled it in some water, would they think I turned water to fruit juice? You know, it could be. So it all depends on how you look at it, but it's always a proof, right? Someone needs proof of something. So I think that they must have shown them some type of proof of something to make them come on their side. I couldn't agree more with that one. And I think the proof is of their power, which is where the others come in. I think that uh, what happened was that the, the children of the forest created the others in some way. And I'm, I'm building up to asking you your view on this because I know you've got views on this one. Uh, but I think that they created the children of the forest. Humanity realized, the first men realized, you know what, we need them. We, we have to work together against these creations that have run amok. And that is what it was. But humanity saw that actually the children of the forest had huge power. What's your take? Do you believe the show version that is there broadly, that the children of the forest created the, the others, the White Walkers, as a weapon against humans? Yes, they had to. When you look at the children of the forest, they'll tell you, and they said it, you know, they give you hints throughout the thing about, you know, how they operate. And they say, you know, we live long lives, but we do not have many numbers, right? Human beings, they procreate so much, there's no way to stop them, just more and more and more. So they could not win this war versus them. And when you look at exactly what their power is, when you look at body snatching, what that entails is having someone fight your war, right? So if you could body snatch, whether it's animals or anything else, you're not putting yourself in harm's way you're putting that creature in harm's way so you don't have to get damaged. The others are the exact same thing. It's finding a war because the children from the beginning have always played the long game because they live long lives so they can. So when they create the others and they have the others go out there and that first uh, original long night, that's what they did. They hid away. They hid and stayed away while the others just ravaged the lands. And we know that the others basically had all the Westeros conquered when they first came out and that's why they had to go through the whole last hero had to search them out and find out the children of the forest to try to figure out some way how to defeat it and oh lo and behold when they did find them they knew how to defeat them they just so happened they had to answer right so they set that whole thing up on purpose so that they could look like the heroes, so that they could look like we're the savior of mankind. We're the one who's going to save you. But in reality, they're the ones who put those others out there to wipe everything out. So I do believe that they created the others, whether it was a piece of dragon glass to the chest of a man that did it. I'm not sure. Maybe so. When we hear the, uh, the Night Queen and the description of the Night King, it seems a little bit different. We don't know where the Night Queen came from. Right. We don't they don't tell us how she was created. But we know that when this guy had sex with her, the Lord Commander of the Night's Watch after the long night, when he had sex with her. All right. He turned to the Night King right after that. So somehow from him giving her his seed, that made the, uh, the other. So we also see a form of that dealing with Craster with baby. So something with seed and a baby or whatever is how the White Walkers were created. But how the initial, uh, original White Walkers created, we we, sure, we don't know. There's no way to tell. But I don't think Dan and Dave just made that up, this dragon glass to the chest on their own. I think they were told that. So I do believe it has something to do with some form of dragon glass. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't. 
disagree with that. And I think what is fascinating, what I find fascinating about what you're saying is this idea that this was all a, a big plan, a ploy by the children of the others to create, sorry, the children of the forest, to create the others, to attack humanity so that humanity would go looking for the children of the forest so that they would then go ah we know how to defeat them and they would then look like the good guys that's I, that is a, a fascinating perspective of uh, on where this might have been from because i think most people would agree that the children of the forest created the others i think most people would probably also agree that they kind of got out of control in some way that they got bigger and nastier and all the rest of it. But I think the thing that the, the missing bit of this equation for, for many of us is what, what won that first long night? What was it that actually did, did it? What pushed the others back? So what it, if your theory is that this was the children of the others who knew how to do this, they'd set this all up. They said, OK, the others are coming in. Finally, the humans are coming to us. They've fallen into our trap. They believe that we're the saviors. They believe we're the good guys. What was it that the children of the others that oh, stop calling the children of the, others, the children of the forest said to the humans? uh this is how you defeat the others you defeat the others with dragon glass because you have to defeat the others in order to defeat the whites right so the whites are going to keep coming on you burn and burn them and then they're going to kill some of you they're going to get resurrected so as we've seen in the show when you take out the the uh the, um, the others you kill a lot of the whites so the this thing was uh the weapon that they've always used right a weapon that they've used from the beginning that they fought the giants with that they fought mankind with this is the weapon that was able to destroy the others the dragon glass just so happens to be that they're the the smiths of this mm -hmm. dragon glass right so it's all this comes together they are the ones who said hey you want to beat them use this and then all of a sudden they when the night's watch was formed they would give them dragon glass every year here's some more dragon glass for you and we're going to tell you that there's some special spells on this dragon glass so you don't think that you can just grab any dragon glass and use it yourself because why would they just get those special daggers from the children why wouldn't they just mine it themselves you know so they had to lie to them and tell them this it's like the wall you know there's really no proof that the wall has any magic that is really on it. They claim that it has magic on there, but when has that truly been tested? Because when the Night King was there living in the Dread Fort, he had rooms, they said, that were literally inside of the wall. His steps were carved out of the wall, and he was living there all those years, no problem. So where was this magic? It was supposed to keep them out. Why didn't it keep him and his wife out from living inside the wall? So when you look at this magic that they claim that's on the wall, I think it's just fugazi, just like with the with the way they say it about their dragon glass. They just gas people, make you think that they're special, but they truly aren't. Well, on the wall, personally, I think there is magic there. I think mm. that uh, it's uh, Melisandre talks about her magic being stronger, which seems to imply there's something special going on at the wall. Uh, Silverwing, uh, the dragon in Fire and Blood, doesn't want to pass beyond the wall, which seems to imply there's some sort of magical barrier there. So I personally, I, I subscribe to the idea that there is a magical barrier there. The, the wall, when it was first built, was just a normal-sized wall. It wasn't mm. this massive thing that was going on. It, it got added to over the centuries until it reached its ridiculous height now. So personally, I subscribe to that idea. But but the uh, the, the the bigger point you're making about this, the, the children of the forest saying, here's the dragon glass. This is how you do it. We're the only providers. That kind of ties in with this idea about um, Dragonstone, which they kind of played with on the show, which is that this is where ultimately the dragon glass comes from because there's a huge mine of it down there. Do you think then that Dragonstone was an outpost for the children of the forest? I think they were definitely on there. 
and I think that it really comes down to that when, when you look at Valyrian steel is something else that kills like the White Walkers, right? We know that that kills them. Hmm. We don't know the exact formula of Valyrian steel, but I do believe it has something to do with regular steel, dragon glass, and dragon fire mixed together that makes this. And that's the reason why it's so effective because it has bits of, of obsidian inside of it and stuff. So yes, I do believe that they did live on Dragonstone and that's where they mined most of their stuff from was Dragonstone and they, they went back and forth. That's why I think that when they showed the, uh, the paint, the, the carvings in the walls in the show, I don't believe then they just made that up themselves. I, I believe that, that that's what happened because when you look at the Ariane chapters and she uh, wins the winter sample chapter, I'm not trying to spoil anything, you see her that she's in the cave and it's basically almost the same type of drawings as drawings on the wall from the children of the forest and she's looking at them. So it's basically almost the same exact thing. Yeah, and she's going through the, the rainwood at the time, I think. Mm -hmm. um, just going to take a very brief pause just to remind everyone this is a charity uh, um, stream as well this is going out as a YouTube premiere if you are watching live uh, if you do a super chat, if you do a super sticker, everything that you donate goes straight to IRC which is the International Rescue Committee, they do fantastic work, they bring non-competents out from combat areas across the world people who just through no fault of their own, they got caught up in conflict and they just help bring them out. It's amazing work. Please, if you're watching live, please uh, do consider contributing. Or if you're not watching live, there is a link down in the description to how you can donate. Uh, but I want to pick up on this idea about the children of the forest uh, and Dragonstone and those people who have been watching the last few of these um secrets of videos that i've been doing i've put this uh to to various people so apologies if this idea is not new to you but i love this idea that that the key places for the children of the forest are islands now when you First of all, you have the Isle of Faces that perhaps we can unpick this in a moment, but it's clearly important. Perhaps it's the hub of the Weirwood Network. Perhaps there's still Children of the Forest there. Who knows? But it's clearly a Children of the Forest important place. You get Dragonstone, another island. That seems to be where the um, uh, where, where the Dragonglass Mine was. Then you get another island. You get uh, a Starfall, where you get the you get the Sword Dawn, which we don't know all the details of it yet with House Dane, but clearly that was somehow involved in the probably the first Long Night and probably the second Long Night as well. What do you think is going on with the the fact that there are islands that seem to be important? It seems that somehow the White Walkers cannot cross these water these water bodies, and they know it that this is where the safety is where they're able to stay at so that's think that's why they keep themselves separated from uh being uh, on the continents and everything else that that's where you know when when they sat and stayed there and the andals did come and did attack the uh, attack the land you know it is said that the andals were able to conquer everything but they couldn't stop the green men on the isle of faces right they couldn't stop them so if there was some children that survived they think they survived right there so it's a defense mechanism that they have all their major things are all in these places. As you said, they have the island right here so they can always have access to dragon glass. They have the isle where all their, isle of faces where all of their, mostly all their werewoods, the most important werewoods all gathered right there. And then you have Starfall where we have Dawn, which Dawn is most likely Lightbringer, right? At least in my eyes, and I'm sure in the eyes of many people out there, that's what it is. Most likely Dawn is Lightbringer. And it's just a, the person who is the sword of the morning is just a person who holds that song sword for Azor Ahai when he is reborn. Hmm. Yeah, I, I I agree with you completely. Let's pick up on the uh, and I'm really pleased about that because this is this is my my I don't know if this is my pet theory, but it's something that I keep on putting to other people, and it's just like yes, the islands that has to be important. It's never spelt out by George R. R. Martin that islands are important but so many important things are on islands let's talk about one of those islands the isle of faces the isle of faces is clearly it's mysterious it's um it's almost never seen we hear about it in legend in recent history only two people have ever been there 
what do you think is actually on the Isle of Faces? I would say it, that's where all the main where would network is on the Isle of Faces. That's what everything like if, if you want to say these trees are all connected, that is the master hub of mm. them. And that's why it's so important for them to keep that right there. We have the green men up there. We don't know exactly what the green men are. You know, the, the maces will tell you that they're just regular men in green clothing. But when you look at the description and old Nan, and I believe what old Nan says is true, that these are these are people that with horns on their heads and they draw and they <laughs> ride elks and everything else. I believe that these are, you know, some uh, hybrids of children of the forest and humans and plus regular that, that protect the island. And I do. I think that is what that uh, the significance of that is of that place. Yeah, I think I agree. So it, it's like the hub of the Weirwood Network. This is like the mainframe, and the the Green Men, as you say, we don't know huge amounts about them. We're just told that they're the defenders of it. Anyone who tries to get to the Isle of Faces, they get that the ship gets blown away by mysterious winds, or it gets like flocks of birds coming down and pecking at people until they they, they go the other direction. It it is kept secret and it's kept secret by this kind of nature magic that seems to be the the children of the forest's forte now one person that we know who did go there is howland reed he went there right before robert's rebellion right before the tourney at harren hall he paddled it's almost like he was called there he paddled down the rivers until he got to the isle of faces uh, he, he got across onto there and it said he spent the winter there which may well have been a couple of years of real time and then after that he sort of goes off and he seems very influential and all the rest of it what do you think he was up to there did he meet the children of the forest did he hook up to the weirwood network what, what do you think he spent all his time there doing i think he was learning magic i think he was learning i think specifically the magic he learned was the was the hammer waters i think that's when he was there that's think it took him that long to learn that i think that could still come into factor i don't believe the show version of the white walkers attack and the first time they attack winterfell they they die I don't think that's the way it's going to go down. From what we've seen, um, they were just about an unstoppable force before. I don't think they can be defeated that easily. So I think it's quite possible if he did learn, he may be one of the only people left who was able to conduct this type of magic if he learned that. And we know that the reeds and over there and in their little spot over there where the children of the forest tried to use the hammer of waters again, but it failed. And that's why it became a, um, a marshy area. It could be a, a second attempt. Howland Reed may have to try this again to try to stop the White Walkers from crossing down from the north, quite possibly at the neck. Maybe it's going to be the broken neck. He'll break the neck with it. But I think that most likely when he was there, he was learning some spells from the children of the forest. So you think that Howland Reed will emerge? I mean, I agree completely. I think he definitely will reappear. But you think he will reappear to perform some huge magical spell yes. almost on behalf of the children of the forest. Yeah, I think he has to. I think that you're not going to – there's nothing that they've ever talked about in the past that we haven't seen in the present, right? So every time they brought up any spell or anything that's been done in the past, we see in modern times. So I think that that's a good, there's a good possibility that we got, we're going to see that spell be used again only person that would be able to do it would be the reeds you see how his son you know we know they 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 are interbred with the children of the forest in fact they are so interbred with the children of the forest that when they were having wars with the children of the forest they took the children of the forest side and fought against men right so that's how interbred they are with the children of the forest so i think that it would be Helen when the white walkers come his purpose would be to try to stop the slow of them by performing this Probably maybe in the same spot, but I think a little bit long. And that could be right why that they could be considered a little safe over there. That's a that's not exactly an island, you know, but their their place where they live basically is an island, floats around, right? Their castle floats all around. So it's like a moving island. So these are the two spots where they tried to perform the hammers of water, right over there. Um where Howland Reed is from. 
and over and down at the Isle of Faces. These are the two spots where they attempted it. So if something's going on there with both of those spots. And I think that that's what it would that's what it comes down to. Highland Reed was definitely sent down there, in my opinion, to learn the Hammers of War. Wow. I mean, I think this this changes the shape of how we might see the end game of these stories. I mean, I think that there's definitely a, a role he had to play originally in Robert's Rebellion. Um, if you're interested, I did a few videos uh, linked down in the description to uh, what role I think Howland Reed played with Blood Raven in setting up Rhaegar uh, and Lyanna and setting up the entirety of Robert's Rebellion and all the rest of it. So I think he had some immediate roles going on there. But this idea in terms of he will cast the hammer of the waters to sunder part of uh, Westeros from another part to defend presumably the south, that that's the idea, I assume, to defend the south against what's happening in the north, that would require huge sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Do you think that Howland Reed then is going to round up a whole load of people and sacrifice them in some way, it, we we know that the the weirwood trees they love sacrifices. That that's the whole point. You kill people in front of the weirwood trees. Is Howland Reed going to be orchestrating a mass sacrifice in order to achieve some kind of uh, flood across the neck? Then he could. I don't know if he's going to actually take people and hang their entrails and all of the the weirwood trees down at the Isle of Faces and then sacrifice people that way. You know. Obviously, if you hear if someone's hanging people's body parts in trees like Christmas trees, obviously these aren't good people, right? Mm -hmm. So I do believe it will require a sacrifice, but it could be the death of the people who are remaining on that side could be the sacrifice. Like when those people, when he cast the spell and while that spell is going on, people most likely will be dying. No one's not the whole area is going to be clear of people. People will probably be dying at the same time that the spell is being casted. So it could be a situation like that. Is it beyond him or beyond me to, to think that they could round people up and put them in the trees? We have not seen that from Howland. Uh, if it was Melisandre, you know, I would say, yes, there's no doubt. She'll take as many people as she can and burn them up and do whatever she has to do. Uh, but I, we, we don't know of, of Howland's character of doing anything like that. But So I think the, the sacrifice that we could see is the actual the people that will be dying. Uh, when when the, the spell is actually cast, yeah, I think I think I'd agree that I can't see him just like randomly killing a whole load of people in order to do this. But in the same way that uh, my view is that what Euron is trying to do off the south coast is to create a huge battle, lots of lots of deaths, lots of sacrifice, and he's going to use that as a way to cast spells that he's been wanting to do uh, with the sacrifice of the battle. In the same kind of way, I could imagine someone, maybe Howland Reed, casting great magic on the basis of the people who have been sacrificed in battle. I could certainly see that happen. Um, I, I basic, I, I'm very much on board with this idea that the... The invasion of the others is not just going to stop a little bit into the north in the way that it did in the show, which is it, it felt a little anticlimactic to me. This idea that that, that this, this this huge invasion we were waiting seven and a half seasons from for that they got as far as Winterfell and then that's it. I think that they will move south. It will start to feel as if the others are going to take over the entirety entirety of Westeros. Personally, I think the climactic battle, probably somewhere around that central hub of Westeros that we've been, everything has been revolving around for so long. The Isle of Faces, Harren Hall, the Inn at the Crossroads, that whole area that has been the, the center point of so many stories uh, that we've had. And, and it makes sense to me if that tying in with a vision that Daenerys randomly had a while ago, if that is where the sort of the climactic battle ends. So let, let's rewind a little bit, though, to this idea of what is it that defeats the others? Because this is perhaps the thing that drives all of the story, is that the, 
the army of the de the dead appears unstoppable, and yet they are stoppable. Clearly, they're not gonna. I mean, let's not put it beyond George R. R. Martin to have a horrendous ending, but they're not gonna win. They have to be stopped somehow. My take, though, has always been that George R. R. Martin, the great pacifist is not going to have the answer to all of this as being there's a big battle and the people with the better weapons win. That just doesn't sit right with me. It works better for me, this idea of the, the magic that created them has to be undone somehow. So what's your take in terms of what the ultimate end is for the others as creations of Children of the Forest how how are they going to be defeated? I when I hear about wars and usually deal with wars or like not myself, but heard about wars and you know experienced people going to war and I know friends who've gone there and come back. But what I know about war is or war is is a means to get to a political end, right? That's all any war ever fought is. There's no war that's ever fought to wipe someone out. That's genocide, right? So if you're just wiping out the whole people, that's called genocide, it's not war. War is a battle that's fought to get to a political end, to make someone submit to you, and then you make a political end. So if you could say that eventually there could be a political end between the, the, the white walkers and, and human race, and they can coexist at some point, I could see that definitely happening. I could see that, you know, someone having to sacrifice themselves, you know, whether it's a new night queen that they that they want a new night queen or someone has to become the new night king to go back to the north with them or something like that. I would rather see an ending like that. And I could see George doing something like that other than just they defeat the White Walkers. That's it. The threat's over and yada, yada, yada. So I would rather myself and I think that's a good possibility that there will be a political end when this is all said and done after this war at some point someone will be able to communicate with them. They'll be able to talk something out. And whether it's they have to sacrifice a person to go back there with them. I know there's a lot of rumors that Jon Snow would sacrifice and he'd become the next Night King and go back with them. Uh, there's the other people who said it would be Daenerys. Uh, I thought if it was going to be anyone, it would be Cersei. You know, it could be anyone. I could see them doing anything, but I, I could see that playing out when it's all said and done. That's, that's really interesting. So, so the... The communication issue will be overcome in your view that the, at the moment that the others aren't saying anything in mm. the books, they're, incre that they're incredibly quiet, silent. They do seem to have a language that we're calling scroth, uh, but humans don't understand it at all. They seem to leave messages lying around in sort of artwork of dead bodies and things like that. But if there's a message there, it's slightly confused. Um, so your take is that that communication issue is going to be overcome some way and they're going to uh, understand that what the others need is some sort of sacrifice, someone to sort of go go north with them in some way. Yeah, I think it, it, if I had it my way, that's what I think is going to happen. That's what I hope happens. Mm -hmm. If it's just they defeat the others, the threat's going to me, that's boring. And I don't think George R. R. Martin is boring. And as you said, he's he's studied wars and he understands what war is. And as I just said before, you know, a war is just a mean to get to a political end. So we do know they do have a language. They actually were going to try to make that language for the show. Right. So the fact that they were going to try to do it must mean at some point when they were first started the show that they thought it wasn't important enough that they had to make the language. But they switched it and changed it and said, hey, let's make these people a little bit more ominous, more Michael Myers, more Jason-like. Let's make them more evil. But in the books, they're not described as that. They don't look like they look on the show. They look angelic. They look beautiful, like they're the most beautiful creatures you've ever seen when they're described in the books, you know, like ice Targaryens, basically, like elfish, you know, so... It's a whole different situation. They played them and the show as ugly, disgusting creatures that are just coming to ravage everything. But that doesn't seem like the way they're going in the in the books with them. And they have respect. Uh, you could see that when Waymar Royce fights the guy, the other people step back. 
they all step back and they all watch and they you hear them laughing at him like how dare you challenge me are you crazy this guy and they let this guy fight him one-on-one -on -one, right they're not just savages like the whites who just keep attacking and jumping on you and that's it no they calmly step back and said hey have your shot do what you can do and they laughed at him and they beat him up so they have a form of intelligence they know exactly what they're doing and we know they have their own language so why give them all those things if you're not going to communicate with them in the end mm, I, I think that that's a very persuasive argument i think that for me, I agree completely that this isn't going to be a battle at the end of it. Yes, there will be battles, but the the solution to this isn't just a battle. I think for me, the most likely is still the idea of undoing the magic in some way. That that on the show they didn't do it very well or explain it very well, but they the 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 thing that they seemed to be trying to show was that to create the white walkers you do dragon glass in the heart in front of a weirwood tree to uncreate them you do valyrian steel in the heart in front of a weirwood tree and that sort of undoes the magic rather than kills them that that seems to be what they were saying and i think there'll be some element of that undoing of the magic uh, that will cause an end to this. But let's go back to the children of the forest. Do you think they will survive this? I think they have survived it. So <laughs> <laughs> I think they have. I think they played this has all been a plan of theirs from the beginning. Everything they have seen, all this outcome from the beginning. And they knew exactly what would happen from the beginning of this whole thing, as we've seen with Bran. And when I had made up a, a theory a long time ago about the Children of the Forest being evil, you know, it, at that time, we never, we didn't see the whole door thing. So a lot of people didn't really go with it because they thought that how could these people, you know, be in different timelines and everything else. But we've seen from Bran that he was able to affect Hodor before he was born, right? So that's way the way it is with the children they're able to go back they seen this whole thing they set this whole thing up and i think that their plan in the end was to take the iron throne and i think they were successful i think that i don't believe that that's bran i think bran was killed in that cave and i think that blood raven was also captured and killed because when i look at those two people if you really look at it and you say all right why would they need bran to fastly to do a fast download when you have someone who is already, if he's, if his importance is to defeat the White Walkers, and you, we're looking at Blood Raven now, he would already have the knowledge to do it. So why would you want to transfer the knowledge to Bran? The only thing I could see them transferring the knowledge to Bran, the only difference between him and Bran is that he's stuck in that one spot and Bran was mobile, right? So that's the only reason I could see him wanting to transfer his knowledge to Bran. And I don't think it's a transfer. I think he just t overtook Bran and body snatched Bran. And that's over. It's like I think Blood Raven was body snatched by the last green singer. That's why I think he's called the last green singer. It's the same guy just going from body to body. The same Children of the Forest guy. He's the last one. He, they, they coaxed Blood Raven to get him there, took him over for his body, and they did the same thing to Bran. That's why they had to get Bran up there. You know, they had to have Bran lose his legs. They had to give Bran a reason to come up there. He would never would have came. If he was still walking and everything else, Bran would have never came up there. He would have never wanted to go up there. He went up there thinking he could somehow get, he'd get his powers back for his legs so he could walk again. That was his driving force. And we know that the crow that he was feeding was controlled by the children of the forest, the one that was saying corn and everything else. And that's why he was going up there to begin with. So when you look at the whole situation dealing with, I can go all the way back to the beginning of history with these children of forest. They have set this whole thing up. But real quick, I'll say that when Harren Hall was being built, right? When Harren, we'll go back a little bit further. When Danny's the dream of was, was getting dreams. Okay. That was sent from the children of forest. You want to say that that's Blood Raven going back because it was his body at the time sending Danny's these dreams. No one else over there was known for getting dreams. That's why they called her Danies the Dreamer. That's why she got that title. Or everyone would be called the Dreamer, right? So they gave her that specific title because she was getting these dreams and she predicted the doom of Valyria to get the Targaryens out of there. The Targaryens 
are the ones who believe it, they get the dragon stone. Just so happens when they get the dragon stones years later, everything is going on there. Heron, Heron the Black starts taking over all the Westeros. He starts to build Heron Hall years later after, after they were at the dragon stone. He was going to the Isle of Faces, cutting down the weirwood trees in the Isle of Faces and using them for his rasters for Heron Hall, right? And, and that's a no-no. He was the only one that was really able to get over there and start doing it. He built a structure, a structure that was no one can defeat, right? There's no way that anybody could defeat Heron Hall, defeat him with Heron Hall that had a regular land army. It was just impossible. But it just so happens that as soon as he put that last brick in place, that's when Aegon Targaryen landed on Westeros with the only weapon that could defeat him. All right. So when you look at all these situations, I believe there's the children who knew everything that was going to go on. They're the ones who sent Danes those dreams so they can get those dragons to Westeros to stop this man from destroying their Isle of Faces so they could take him down. And I think you, there's even there's a lot more that goes into it. But you could go all the way back to from then all the way till now. And you could see how they played the long game, like I said before, from the beginning. And they set everything up to end where they wanted it to end. Well, I mean, on my channel, I quite often say, "If in doubt, blame Blood Raven." I think you're you're exceeding even where, what I uh, I think here. Uh, so, all, all going back even to Danis the Dreamer, and that's uh, that's uh, fantastic stuff. Uh, thank you so much. I think um, let's let's just uh, we're going to start wrapping this one up now. But I just want to take your your view on the end of the show. Obviously, the big thing with Bran becoming the king. Bran, as you've said, he's downloaded from the uh, the the Weirwood Network. He and the Weirwood Network had previously had uploaded into it all of these sort of memories and lives of the children of the forest. Does this mean that the ultimate winner of the Game of Thrones, of everything that's happened in this whole series, whatever's going on with all of these other characters, the ultimate winner? is the children of the forest is that what your your whole argument is that everything yeah. has been a long game to lead to them winning yes everything has been a long game from the beginning when they lost their lands from the beginning they had to get their lands back it took all this time for them to do it but in the end i believe they body snatched brand and that is the last green seer sitting on that iron throne and now they run their country once again that was their plan from the beginning and it took all these years and they you know when you have when you live long lives like they do like they say they do they could they could wait things out they could let plans take a hold and i think that's exactly what happened because it would make no sense that if blood raven or the last green street but whatever you want to say he had so much more experience and using all these powers What's the sense of transferring them to Bran? The only difference between him and Bran is that Bran is mobile and he was stuck there. So he needed to get out of there. He was going to die and he needed to get out of there and he needed a new body to get into. Bran was the body for him to get into. And that's why they, they moved him out. And that, and that was the whole reason why they did it. That, that's the only reason I could see it making any sense for them to do it. Because if not, it just doesn't make any sense. I think Blood Raven, he's a shisty guy. This is a guy who who was him and his girl. They was, you know, visions, all visions, I think, and whether it's for law or anything else, this is all forms of the children of the forest is sending them out in different ways. And that's it. So I think that all these magics that we hear about, it's all the same magic, just in different ways. It's, you know, if it was languages, I would say it's the same language, but different dialects, right? So that's the way I feel about this magic. It's all the same magic, whether it's blood magic, and all these sacrifices all basically comes back to blood, right? Sacrifice, whether you're burning someone, whether you're chopping their body up, it all comes back to blood and it's all the same exact magic and it's all ran by the children of the forest. Wow. Thank you so much. That, 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 that I'm so glad I've, I've, I've had you on to sort of work our way through this. That is the Tony Teflon, Children of the Forest, <laughs> all-encompassing theory, the universal theory of the Children of the Forest. Uh, thank you so much for that. I, it's, uh, I, 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 I don't think I'm going to add anything to that. I think I'm just going to uh, let that one hang because I think it's, it's a fantastic way of, of, of 
changing our view of of the whole story that we've got in front of us so it's not just about these characters that we see but it's actually about what's going on behind it and what has been going on for millennia behind it um i just want to remind everyone this is a charity uh, video so if you are watching it live as part of a youtube premiere then uh, any super chats any super stickers they will be going to the charity which is the international rescue committee which is a fantastic charity rescuing people from war zones rescuing completely innocent people whose lives were being ruined uh bringing them out and giving them hope which is fantastic if you're not watching this live if you're watching this a bit later there's a link down in the description to how you can help as well uh tony thank you so much for coming on uh, do you want to just let people know where they can find you on the internet no doubt. Thank you for having me, Robert. You know, I'm a big fan of yours. And I will say this, maybe you don't know this, but you could ask you could ask our common friend, Gray Area, that when I seen you at, at the Con of Thrones, it was the first time I got a chance to see you and everything else. You were the only person that I've ever was at Con of Thrones that I asked to be introduced to, that I asked her specifically to introduce me to you because I'm such a big fan of your channel. I've never done that for anybody else. But you don't believe you can ask, she tell you. <laughs> but uh, that's what I did, because I was a big fan. So it's really an honor for me to be here, you know, and thank you for having me. But anyone who is looking for me, you could find me on Tony, Te no, I'm about to get to give my name. You can find, <laughs> <laughs> you can find me on Teflon TV on YouTube. Teflon TV on YouTube, the Tony Teflon on, on Twitter. I don't know what my Instagram stuff is, but just find me on YouTube, Teflon TV, I'm there. All these theories I've had, I have them all there. If you go more in depth into them and everything else and give you exactly why I feel exactly the way I do. Thank you again for having me. I will be in the chat during this premiere and I will be donating to this charity. Oh, excellent. Thank you. The honor is mine. That that was that was very touching what you said. That I hugely appreciate that. Thank you. And it was a pleasure meeting you as well, it has to be said. Uh, thank you again, Tony. It's been an absolute pleasure and a delight. Uh, there will be links appearing somewhere up here to the usual things like uh, other videos of mine and, and my Patreon and things like that. Uh, but uh, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. I will see you all again soon. Take care. Peace. Stay sexy. <laughs>